the proud company of Wilmington, Delaware, makers of better things for better living through chemistry, presents the Cavalcade of America. Our story, John Brake. Our star, Cornell Wilde. To men who have lived through a war, who have lived with excitement, with danger, a quiet life in a quiet town is much too passive a promise to be keen about. Such was the problem of young George Westinghouse of Schenectady, New York, in 1866. But it's a ridiculous idea, Father. I, I can't go back to school now. I don't see why not, George. The war interrupted your education. You can pick up just where you left off. Well, Father, won't you... Listen? I'm not finished. I've worked to see my sons get ahead in the world. Well, I still can go ahead in my own way. First, I want to be a mechanic. I had other plans for you. But I like working in the shop. I, I, I have a bent for it. That's fine. That's all right. You've a real talent, George. But it must be trained. Go to union colleges. I want you to study engineering. Well, I think I can study engineering just as well in the shop. I'm but... sorry, but there's no use arguing the point. Remember, George, when I gave you permission to join the army, I did it on your promise that you'd continue your schooling when the war was over. I'm holding you to that promise now. Well, yes, but I, I wish you'd... Unless you intend to renege on your promise. No, I, I won't renege. Well, then it's settled. You will matriculate in union college as soon as the new term begins. I refer you now, gentlemen, to the 19th point in Lord Bacon's table of the degrees of comparative instances of heat. Bacon tells us that, on the whole, the heat of the heavenly bodies is augmented in three ways. Mr. Westinghouse. Mr. Westinghouse. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Mr. Westinghouse, will you be kind enough to recite Bacon's three rules concerning the augmentation of heat of heavenly bodies? Sir? Did I startle you, Mr. Westinghouse? Well, no, sir, not exactly. <laughs> I have propounded a question, Mr. Westinghouse. Would you care to expound on the answer? Um, <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, let me see. Uh, the uh, uh, rules for augmenting the uh, heat of heavenly bodies, uh, that was what you asked, wasn't it, sir? Yes. You see, <laughs> I, I know the question. <laughs> Do you also know the answer? No, sir, I don't, and honestly, I don't think I ever will. <laughs> May I see the paper you've been scribbling upon, Mr. Westinghouse? Bring it to me. Yeah. Okay. Hey, here it is, sir. Well, well it, it's just... It a... is a slanderous cartoon of me, an impudent, sir, a confounded impudent. You will come with me at once to the dean. Well, George, what do you say to this? Well, I, uh, I think perhaps uh, Professor Leffert is a, a, a trifle too sensitive. Dean, well, okay, I will not I'll tolerate. this, Professor. Uh, I think you'd better go back to your classroom. Very well. I'm, I'm sorry, sir. I, I really am. We I really cannot permit things like this. You know that, George. No, I suppose not. I, I'll, I'll, apologize. I'll apologize to the Professor, sir. If that might be a good idea. George, you're not very happy here, are you? No, sir, I'm not. Why not? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm marking time. I'm not moving ahead. Well, but you're young yet, you. No, sir, I'm, I'm not. No, no man who's ever been to war is young. War sweats the youth right out of you and makes you impatient. You understand, sir, I know that education is a, a, a great thing. Books and learning, that, that's fine, but, well, I, I'm impatient. George, I'm going to write a letter to your father. Well, telling him of my little prank? No. Telling him that, in my opinion... You've had enough of waiting. I think you're right. I think you should get started on what you want to do right away. Oscar. Hey, Oscar. Hey, yes, George. Did you praise those metal clamps? Now, oh, George, you know what your father said. He said, no favor. He said, Oscar, George must do a day's work for a day's pay and no favor. Yes, I know, Oscar. I know. Now, what about those metal clamps? George, if he finds out the clamps... Yes, I made them. Yeah? Let me see. Wait, I get them. Yes. Oh, these are fine. Fine. If I lose my job, that's also fine. Fine. Come on. We'll, we'll try them out. Look, I have a lot of I'll help you with it later. Come on. I get my dozen 
don't like that. Come on in. Lock the door. Uh, I will try this out. A little model railroad I built. We'll plant this extra set of tracks and... Oh, uh-oh. George, open this door. Oh, oh, don't stop. I, 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 Will you open this door? Yes, right away, Father, right away. I thought I saw you coming in here. George, what the dickens are you up to? What? George. Toy trains? No, they're not toy trains. It, it, it's a model of a real railroad. You told me that if I took you into the shop, you'd stick on the job. Now look. Toy. It's not a toy. It's a model I... I built it to work out an idea. An idea for what? A car replacer. A what? A car replacer. An, an idea I have that will get derailed trains back on their tracks in one half and one quarter of the time it now takes. George, I've got something more important for you to do than run toy trains. I want you to get home and cleaned up. You're taking the 520 train to New York. There's some special work to be done for Mallory and company. Yes, sir. Now, George, I'm depending on you. Don't get off on one of your wild ideas and forget what you're being sent for. I won't. All right. When you get back, we'll talk some more about your, uh, uh, car replacer. Car replacer. Uh, what next? What next? Goodbye, George. I've got to get back to the shop. Yes, sir. Oscar! Hey, yes, Mr. Westinghouse. Oscar, you've got your work apron on backwards. Mr. Westinghouse, believe me, that's only from your point of view. I beg your pardon, but is, is this seat next to you occupied? Uh, 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 no. Well, would you mind if... Uh... No, no, not at all. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm afraid I'll have to disturb you. Oh, not at all. I just want to get my hat box ready. Well, uh, let me do that. I'll do that. Uh, thank you. Be careful. Oh, I've got it. Oh, no. oh I... I'm sorry. The train lurched. I, I hope your hat isn't ruined. No one keeps hats in hat boxes. They don't? Of course not. This is my lunch. <laughs> oh, dear. Looks like I've got chicken wings with cherry tart dressing. <laughs> Looks a little messy, doesn't it? Oh, but it smells good. Oh, will you join me? Well, uh... Please, there's more than enough of the both of us. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, my name is George Westinghouse. Mine is Marguerite Walker. Uh, here... Thank you. You know, maybe I'll work on that. On what? Well, baggage racks that'll hold baggage, even when the train scoots around the curve. It's an idea, hmm? Very good idea. You see, I'm I'm an inventor, in a way. But in what way, Mr. Westinghouse? Well, uh, up to now, in a kind of unsuccessful way. I think inventing is wonderful. I once invented something. You did? Mm-hmm. A recipe for turkey pie. Oh. I... <laughs> What's that? I don't know. Town break! Town break! Town break! Town break! Hey, something must be wrong with you. are going to stop. Look out, hold tight! You better stay back, Miss Walker. Uh, brakeman, brakeman, you you know what happened? That freight train stole just ahead of us. Well, didn't the engineer see it? The track is clear and it's broad daylight. Oh, well, he saw it, Miss, but he couldn't stop. Brakes couldn't be set in time. He signaled for down brake as soon as he spotted the freight. You heard it. Uh, yes. Well, he we got to the hand brakes as soon as we could, but by the time we got them set, it was just too late. Each car has its own brake, and each brake has to be set separately. That's right. No, that's wrong. Some way ought to be found to set the brakes all at once from a central point, from the engineer's cab. That's the way it should be done. With blessings on the man that finds that way. That's all I got to say. I got to be seeing about getting some help from the nearest village. It'll take hours to clear the wreckage. You're an inventor, Mr. Westinghouse. Hmm? What do you mean? You heard what the brakeman said. 
blessings on the man who finds the way. to our cavalcade story, Down Break, starring Cornell Wilde as George Westinghouse. On the 8th of August, 1867, George Westinghouse and Marguerite Walker were married in Schenectady, New York. Within a few months, George was working on an idea, a tremendous idea. I finished the diagram, Marjorie. Come take a look. Just tell me this. Will it work? Well, I've gone over it a dozen times. I, I can't find any reason why a railroad brake operated by steam pressure won't do the job. But how does the steam get from car to car? Well, through a hose that runs along the bottom of the train and through the coupling mechanism between the cars. Uh, the steam is generated in the locomotive and then pushed through the hose under tremendous pressure. When the engineer throws the lever, the steam pressure forces the brake against the car wheel. It's it should work, hmm? Are you going to take it to the railroad people? Well, that's a, that's a little way off yet. The idea is only on paper. I'm going to make a model in the shop and really test it. Will your father let you? Oh, I'll do it at night, after hours. With Oscar to help me, I'm, I'm sure I can make it work. Colder than this, I've never seen it. <laughs> Glad you got here, Oscar. Have trouble with the wife? Only once I have trouble with my wife. That's when I came home with my new britches ripped. <laughs> I've got everything set. The boiler has full pressure. I've got about 300 feet of coupled hose stretched outside. Hey, George, look at that gauge. You've got too much pressure. Oh, I need as much as I can get. If, if we can get a 20-pound reading, that'll be enough to get the brace to set firm. Now, you just keep feeding that boiler. Don't let the pressure slide down. I'm going outside by the gauge, all right? Uh, listen, George, you've got too much pressure. You've got enough, not near enough. Listen. Listen for that. To what? The boiler seems are cracking. It's going to blow. No, it's not. I know steam boilers, and this one is going to blow. Now get out. No. If it's... you don't get out, I'll carry you out. Come on now. Oscar, Oscar, are you all right? It's broken. Your foot? No. The scene where my wife fixed my britches. I could have told you this from the beginning, George. I knew your steam brake idea wouldn't work. You knew it? Of course I did. Any good mechanic could have seen it was just illogical. In the summer, the heat would condense your steam before it reached the last car. In the winter, the condensed steam would freeze. Well, then why didn't you tell George that when he told you a sketch? Because I figured he could stand a lesson in practical mechanics. What I didn't figure is that he'd almost blow himself up while learning. Well, could have been worse. Now, George, will you do me a favor? What, well, what is it? Forget your wild ideas and stick to business. Oh, but I... You've got a wife now, George. You've got to buckle down. You owe it to Marguerite. I don't want him to give up his invention, Mr. Westinghouse. An invention isn't an invention until it works, Marguerite. George's doesn't work, so it is not an invention. Just another crackpot idea. But he, he no, can... No, no. Father's right, Marguerite. In view of what happened, I've got to give it up. As Dad says, I've got to buckle down. <laughs> my lunch pail, George? Oh, no, thanks, Oscar. I'm, I'm not hungry. I think I'll just go out in the yard for a while. I've got golf books. No, thanks. I beg your pardon? Yes, can I help you? I'm working my way through college. Really, I am. Well, that's very interesting. I'm selling subscriptions to a wonderful magazine. Oh, no, thank you. Well, it isn't expensive at all. Only one dollar for an entire year. Here's a sample copy of one of the magazines. No, really, I... Some wonderful I... stories and articles. There's one on hunting Himalayan bears. Oh, and... 
I don't expect I'll be getting around to that this year. And there's another on how they drilled a tunnel through the Alps using compressed air. No, miss, I'm sorry. I... There's another story that you'll find in this magazine. What was that? What was that? What you just said about compressed air. Well, they... they In Switzerland, they... Uh, never mind. Is, is it in this copy of the magazine? Yes. I'll buy it. Here, here here's a dollar. But, but that's for a whole year's subscription. Well, I just want this copy. You read the rest. <laughs> It's all here, Marguerite. Simple as pie. I don't understand why I didn't think of it immediately. Think of what, George? Now, look, Marguerite, listen carefully. Mm -hmm. They were building a tunnel through the Alps, the Mount Cena's Tunnel. I've never heard of it. Oh, it doesn't matter. The the tunnel was seven miles long, clear through a mountain. They were using steam drills. Now, when they got a good way through the mountain, a mile or two, they ran into trouble. What trouble? No air. There wasn't enough draft to bring the air that deep into the mountain. Mm -hmm. Not enough to keep the fires going in the steam boilers and leave enough for the men to breathe. And one of the engineers got a bright idea. Instead of using steam to work the drills, he decided to use compressed air. But, but you just said there wasn't enough air inside the mountain to even keep the men alive. Well, that's just it. The, the, the air was compressed with giant pumps outside the entrance to the tunnel. Oh. The compressed air was carried by holes into the tunnel, three or four miles in. And it not only was powerful enough to operate the drills, but it also supplied air to the workmen, do you see? No, darling, I... Well, it's... If compressed air can operate a drill three miles from a pump, three miles, why can't it set a brake a few hundred feet from an engine? Marguerite, that's the answer. Not steam, but air. An automatic air brake. And I'm going to build it. Like my toys, Marguerite? This model train, it's fascinating. Well, I've got it all hooked up for the test. The little engine compresses the air, and the hose carries it to brakes the tight to every wheel in the train. One motion, and the whole train should slide to a stop. You uh, going to try it now, Joe? Yeah, right now, Oscar, as soon as the engine passes me again. I'll pull the lever. Hey, wait. What, something wrong? Huh? No, uh, new britches. I'll wait outside. <laughs> no, no. You wait here. Come on. Here comes the engine now. Here goes the lever. George! Holy smokes! It works! I'll be honest with you, Mr. Card. No one has even bothered to listen to me before. Why not? Well, they laugh at just the idea of my air brake. Uh, one big railroad man almost threw me out of his office, telling me I must be crazy to think I can stop a train with wind. That was his expression. Mm, I don't think the idea is so crazy. Well, will you just let me prove it? What do you need? One of your regular trains on a panhandle railroad. I'll stand all the ex- expense of putting in the brake. Every cent of it. Just give me a train. Oh, I'm a gambler. You've got your train. Mm. This is my wife, Mr. Card, and my father. How do you do, Mr. Card? Oh, you so you've all come down for the party. Hmm? I'm not so pleased about the idea of Marguerite riding along with us. Oh, it'll be perfectly safe. I have my brakeman ready in every car, just in case. You won't need them. I think I'd be pleased beyond reckoning if that turns out to be the case, Mrs. Westinghouse. Well, we're all ready, George. Fine, sir. You ride in the locomotive cab with the engineer, Mr. Tate. He'll take the train along at regular speed to Steubenville. Just apply your brake for normal station stop. Understand? Yes, sir. We'll be riding in the coach right behind the tender. Fine. Well, good luck. Uh, come on, folks. Boy. I wish me luck, Margaret. The train bring us luck. And we need on one. Reasonably sure, yes. Reasonably sure. 
Ever hear of the fellow who was reasonably sure that the gun wasn't loaded? <laughs> no. What happened to him? Well, his widow was reasonably sure she was a widow when the remains was put to rest. <laughs> well, this break will work. Yeah, maybe. And we'll prove it today. Yeah, maybe. We're about a mile from the station now. Just around the bend up ahead. I think I ought to begin to ease on the brakes. No, no, no need yet. Another few hundred yards. But if this thing goes... No, don't... just as you hit the turn. All right. And slowly. Now, remember, just ease it into the station. Yeah. Here's the turn. All right. Easy. Easy, it is. Hey, look ahead. On the track. What? A wagon. A crazy fool. The brake, quick. All right. be hornswoggled. We we stopped in time. We done it for fair. We stopped in time. And not three feet to spare. Come on. Let's get out and see what happened in back. We must have given them quite a tumble. Fifteen years of riding an engine cab and I never dreamed I'd see a thing like this. Stopping a train with air. With nothing but air. Here comes Mr. Card. He looks a bit shaken. Where's he house? Where's he house? Are you crazy? You almost killed us all back there in the coach. Well, I'm sorry about that, Mr. Carr, but take a look down at the track. No more than 50 feet after I hit the brake, we come to dead stop. Dead stop. Could have killed them all on that wagon. Every living soul. Great Scott. Westinghouse, I want you in my office at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. At, at 8? I'll have the contract drawn up tonight by my attorney. I want you to fit your air brake on every train riding the Panhandle Road. Every one. It'll be standard equipment from now on. And you can take my word for it that every other railroad in the country will follow suit just as fast as they can be supplied. Well, I'll be there, Mr. Card, at 8 o'clock. George. And now, Marguerite, you come with me. Where? Up in the cab. Come on. <laughs> Up you go. Mr. Tate, you too. Uh, We're going on with this test. Now, wait a minute, Tate. Marguerite, you bring her in. What? Me? That's right, you. That's it. Now, now, just pull back this lever. Slowly, real slow and easy. That's it. Well, it's easy. Easy as pie. That's turkey pie. Your special invention. We're here, Marguerite. We found the way. Within a matter of months, all major railroads in the world were clamoring for the amazing brake that stopped speeding trains swiftly and safely by the use of air. The Westinghouse Air Brake Company was formed to meet this demand, and it still exists today keeping alive the memory of George Westinghouse, a restless young man returned from the wars. Thanks to Cornell Wilde and the Cavalcade players for tonight's true story. Tonight's DuPont Cavalcade was written by Irv Tunick. Original music was composed by Arden Cornwell, conducted by Donald Boyes. The program was directed by John Zoller. With our star, Cornell Wilde, you heard Ed Begley as the father, Elaine Ross as Marguerite, and Dan Arco as Oscar. Others were Charles Dingle, Ted Osborne, Parker Fennelly, Bill Zuckert, Patty Pope, and George Petrie. Mr. Wilde can currently be seen in the Warner Brothers production, Operation Secret. Ladies and gentlemen, your National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis needs millions of dimes and dollars to care for the victims of last year's record polio epidemic. Your money helps crippled children learn to walk again. Join the 1953 March of Dimes.
The DuPont Cavalcade of America came to you from the Belasco Theater in New York City and is sponsored by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Tonight, just for laughs, listen to Red Skelton on NBC. Mm-hmm. 